Hey guys. So, it's good to see you all here. Kelly, how are you? Good, you? Hey man, I'm at a bakery. I just finished my scone. I'm good. Oh, Jeremy, you're the bomb. You're the bomb. What's Jeremy? What's your what's your son's name? That's Ezra Funk right now. You know, still still getting her going here in uh, Colorado. So, yeah, very cool. <laughs> well, tell tell Ezra I said good morning and thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming to the, the conference, Ezra. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Well, I'm I'm in a bakery. I don't know. This is the the new wave of conference, right? Might be a four-year-old sitting right next to you making sounds and <laughs> maybe you're eating a no, scone. There's I don't some, know. There's... But my plan today is to work from the bakery for a little bit, my office a little bit. And there's actually a, a bar about a block away with a really nice patio and the weather's been super. So that's where I'll be for the happy hour, I think. Nice. So with your when yeah. presentation, that wasn't live, was it? No, that was not live. That was pre-recorded. The only presentation that's live today is the keynote, which we're about to see. Okay. Um, cool. The others, though, are scheduled to become available at different times. So we have this watch party concept. They're all pre-recorded, and I'm and you can double speed them. I'm I'm told, but three become available, and then three, and then four, and then three. And if you don't want to watch a show, you can. Pop over and ping people at the same time. Yeah. If you guys forgot, you can search the uh, attendance list and filter it according to um, according to interests. No kidding. Just say I'm pinging somebody right now. You know, Dwayne, before we get going, just wanted to add a quick comment on, um, uh, I guess, just the general ESG conversation. One of the things that I saw even this week is some of the, like, uh, I don't know, we'll call it like older, more died in the uh, oil and gas related groups and conferences now really opening up to uh, ESG related discussion. Um, so, like, for example, I was at the PPDM event on Wednesday here in Denver Petroleum really? Group, and, and everybody was saying the most impactful presentation was the one that talked about ESG in the fashion industry and how some of the stuff happening there is very transferable to oil and gas. And um, it's cool. It's nice to see that infiltration. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm, I think that it, it'll be maybe a year before we stop talking about ESG as a separate topic. And this is it's just fully integrated in everything we do. Yeah, I agree. In all the I conferences agree. and everything else. Maybe less. Maybe less. Yeah, maybe less. Hey, Scott, I'm so glad you're here. It's good to see you. I don't, we haven't talked in a couple of years, I think. Yes, sir. Dwayne, nice I'll to let see you. you what, what are you doing these days? Are you still working for yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, still uh, trying to, uh, well, actually, the, the 2022, I'm focused on, I developed um, a pretty handy improvement for production decline analysis, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get really? folks interested in it. Yeah, um, you know, the, uh, the transition to boundary-dominated flow, which is, which is proving super critical to reserves mm -hmm. in shale reservoirs, um, they're, whether you're using decline curve analysis, RTA, um, type curves of any variety, there, there doesn't currently exist a mechanism for predicting that future impending transition. 
um, while you're only working with um, transient flow data. And I've uh, I developed and yeah, published true. it last year at EarthTech, uh, a handy physics-based um, analytical solution for huh. for proactively terminating a transient segment and and initiating a a BDF segment. Interesting. Well, I'll, so, I appreciate. I should go check that out um, because that is a hard problem. Well, thank That's you. A, and a, and a meaningful problem. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Where are you these days? Well, right this minute, I'm at Stir Crazy Baked Goods. It was town. Fort Worth. Fort okay. Worth. Yeah. yeah, I had uh, I had breakfast at my favorite Mexican restaurant with um, migas con verde. And uh, I didn't have to pay for a hotel last night. So, Well, good to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Scott. You, oh, well, yeah, we'll catch up later. Catch up later. But... Um, very good to see you. Glad you're here. Good morning. How are, I, how are I you all? I, uh, I'm glad to see you. Uh, it's what, three, two thirty your time, nearly? Sure is. I can't claim to have had a, as nice a lunch as your breakfast, I'm afraid. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm, uh, I think I'm going to end up ordering uh, fast food delivery for lunch so, is and how, how's your son this morning okay yeah uh, thanks for asking Ray. so yeah my, my son got a post positive covid test um last night two years into this thing managed to avoid it so far and um today it's, it's happened so he's six years old he's a bit under the weather today but um seems to be a little okay. thanks good good well that means you're probably going to come down with here in the in the near future. I hope you do all right. Yeah, count down. Good morning, Doctor Robertson. Good to see you. Morning, Joe. Hi. Good morning, Glenn. It's a beautiful morning in Mira Vista. Uh, rather cloudy morning here, but uh, that's all right. Not too bad. Yeah, we need the rain. Oh, well, yeah, if we get some rain, that'd be stupid. My bunch of my grass is actually dying. <laughs> I, that may that may be my own fault, but um, <laughs> well, well, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Sure, glad you're looking forward to the day. Uh, have you have you figured out how to uh, search the directory yet? You can go, if you go to the directory of people, you can filter by interests, by those color coded interests, and mm -hmm. then you and search by name, and then you can go back um, and and text them, exchange contact information, and text them. And uh, so far, no problems with the website. It seems like a pretty good system to uh, look for different sessions and uh, see what's going on. So so far, so good. Good, good. Yeah, no, I was really impressed. It is, I'm going to turn off my video here because um, I seem to have a little bit of problem with my uh, with my internet connection. So I'm going to stabilize it that way.
Well, it looks like our room is is filling up. That's great. We've got 157 people uh, registered to be here today. Um, and we'll ha and of course the or this recording will be posted um, as soon as it gets finished processing. Uh, you, if so anybody who does happen to miss it this morning, or if you want to rewatch it, you'll you'll have the access to it for the next six months. Okay, hi. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, hi, it is 830. So we're going to go ahead and get started with kicking off our inaugural Carbon Expo. Um, good morning, everyone, and good yeah. afternoon to our keynote speaker, um, Barry Evans. She's uh, visiting us from Scotland today. So um, I hope everyone has had the chance to get inside the platform, have a look around, uh, view Dwayne's introduction video, and also to go ahead and create your agenda for this morning. Uh, we will have four watch parties, so you can pick and choo choose how you want your morning to go. And then as a reminder, all of the recordings will be available after today, so you can refer back in case you miss anything. So Vary is a principal analyst in Wood McKenzie's energy transition practice. She leads a team of analysts looking at the carbon capture and storage market globally. She provides insight and strategic analysis to companies all across our industry who are looking to understand everything that we're also looking to understand, which is opportunities in the emerging energy transition technology. So today she's going to set the scene by taking us through the bumpy path to net zero, drivers, challenges, and opportunities. Thank you, Leslie. Well, uh, um, it's nice to hear that introduction. And um, let me just uh, start by saying it's uh, uh, my very great pleasure to um, join you today. And uh, thank you to Carbon Expo, and in particular, of course, to Duane and to Leslie for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to engage with this platform, because I think it's um, super, really, really exciting. Um, let me just 
first say a little bit about Wood Mac or, or Wood Mackenzie or Wood Mac, as, as I think most people know us, um, and then I'll go ahead and share my my presentation. Um, Wood Mackenzie is a, a global energy and natural resources uh, consultancy and research firm. We provide data, research, insight um, on everything from the primary industries like metals, uh, mining, oil and gas, a value chain, right through to renewables and power markets. And our job really is to help you all, uh, the energy industry and natural resources industry, to make the best decisions that you can um, when it comes to strategy and investment. So um, as part of Woodmac, I sit in a division that looks specifically at energy transition issues, everything from battery, raw materials and circular economy, you know, right through to, to power markets. Um, and so what I hope to do today is to spend 25 to 30 minutes or so kind of talking you through um, the key issues as we see them. We probably won't go too in depth into anything, but my, my aim is to platform the issues that I know will be going into in a bit more depth with the, the other really excellent panel of, of speakers that are that are lined up for today. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully in the world of Zoom, we will, here we are. So I'm gonna do that. And, okay. So I'll first start by saying that uh, net zero and the path to net zero needs multiple decarbonization solutions. And I, that might seem like an obvious thing to say, but I wanna try and emphasize that point uh, and also try to um, guide you to hold this message in your heads as we go through the next half hour. We are, um, uh, on, on a path to a very hot planet at the moment. And our current policies and the trajectory of policies and technologies as they are today, we think will take us to somewhere between two and a half to 2.7 degrees of global warming. And what we are aiming for, if possible, and the most ambitious uh, part of the Paris Agreement that was agreed uh, five or six years ago, and was strengthened uh, last year here in Scotland at COP26, is a limit, an upper limit of one and a half degrees global warming. And the chart I'm showing you uh, here on the slide is the difference between those two paths, basically, um, and how, how we might get there as, a, as an energy industry, as, as a society, actually. So the chart shows global uh, CO2 emissions from energy sources. And the top path is our base case, two and a half to 2.7 degree outlook, the bottom uh, the one and a half. And in between that rainbow color, uh, all the different things that need to happen for us to get there. And this transformation of our energy system, and it truly is a rapid transformation that's needed is underpinned by carbon avoidance measures, by which I mean um, moving away from hydrocarbons as uh, our primary fuel sources in many cases, and for example, fuel switching. So instead of using coal, we use gas. Um, energy efficiency has a huge part to play here. So I think the, the, the way I, I like to talk about that to uh, fellow engineers is taking waste out of a system. I think that translates fairly well. Uh, and um, of course, hydrogen as a low carbon fuel alternative has a part to play in replacing hydrocarbons as a, as a fuel and, and heat and power source in, in, in many sectors. We'll talk about, about that later. But even testing all of these transformations to their limits it only gets us so far. And that's where we see, uh, uh, and others, I think it's fairly well acknowledged across the industry, that carbon reduction and removal technologies have a very important role to play in taking us through the last mile, over the last hurdle of, of, this, of this bumpy path. 
And that's the bright blue bars that are at the very bottom of the swathe of colours. So here we're talking about the role for carbon capture, for direct air capture, uh, and for nature-based, forestry and nature-based solutions as, as sinks, nature sinks of, of CO2. This will not be an easy transition, um, of course. But I want to emphasize here that there are, it's an all the tools in the toolbox type, um, uh, type play here. And um, there are uh, you know, multiple different decarbonization ones uh, required. Okay, let's move on. I, yeah, I thought my video disappeared there. That's why I was uh, hesitating a bit. Uh, we, am I back? Yeah, I think I'm back. Thanks, Leslie. Um, okay, so we have an all the tools in the toolbox approach that's required. What this doesn't call for is a complete eradication of hydrocarbons. And I want to be very clear on that that hydrocarbon share of energy demand needs to reduce. And in the most ambitious version of our scenarios, it needs to reduce by, uh, uh, it needs to half by 2050. But in no, even in the most ambitious of our scenarios, there isn't a call for eradication of hydrocarbons as an energy uh, source. But what I will say is that you can see that the, there is a, a rapid fall and that rapid fall in hydrocarbon demand has potentially far reaching consequences for the energy industry. Sometimes the automatic assumption there is that those far reaching consequences are completely negative. Um, but I hope through the course of the next 20 minutes or so we can point out that there are also myriad and some very sizable opportunities in this transformation ahead. But recognizing that hydrocarbons do have a continued role to play in our energy system, of course, front of mind then becomes make reducing the impact of that hydrocarbon use as much as we possibly can. And this is where we're talking about the mission to decarbonize the oil and gas value chain. And I want to just use this, this uh, visual to talk through the various different options for, for doing that. And one of the backdrops here is, of course, that stakeholders, and when I say stakeholders, I mean boards of directors, I mean governments, I mean the general public, are demanding much greater action and much greater transparency on greenhouse gas um, strategies. And uh, what that means is that targets are being set, they are being expanded, and we saw that to a certain extent um, play out uh, last year at COP26 when there were a, an increasing amount of nationally determined contributions to tackle emissions made and so some of the ones that were already made were, were expanded. If you're thinking about this from an operational perspective, where do you start? Um, and of course you start with the good old low hanging fruit. And when we say that what we mean here is by looking at opportunities to cut down, uh, to change processes in your existing operations so that they become less emissions intensive. And actually just this morning, um, as a really good example of this, I read an update from the UK oil and gas regulator here, and um, it was talking about some really big strides year over year, I think 20% plus reductions in flaring, and inventing in the offshore UK oil and gas sector. So uh, companies are attacking this now, it is possible and, and progress is being made. And I know that similar um, uh, efforts and impacts are being made uh, in the US upstream sector too. Those are the low hanging fruit because they're kind of immediately available today. They're less costly than some of the other initiatives that I'm going to talk about. And they also, as you can see, uh, represented by the, the relative size of the bars here, they also are, are probably uh, relatively low scale in terms of emissions reduction impact. Then if we think about stepping that up and rethinking the way that we power our operations, 
Um, is it possible to use renewable energy uh, to power our operations? Is it possible to think about battery uh, storage, um, perhaps down the line? And I think we're at very early stages of that journey today, but certainly as we move through this decade and, and into next, um, I think we'll see much more of this. And also, if we just take ourselves out of a, an upstream, uh, perhaps, setting for right now and think about rethinking power in an industrial setting, um, this is where low carbon hydrogen as a fuel with high heat potential can also play a big role. And then lastly, the big strategic projects that can really provide big, um, big impact on carbon reduction and removal are things like CCS and integrated hubs, which I'll go on to talk about through the day. So the problem statement here is this all costs a lot of money. Um, carbon abatement technologies like the ones I'm showing uh, on the screen here, uh, low carbon hydrogen, carbon capture at various different um, uh, industry settings, and, and then at the end, direct air capture, are all relatively early stage technologies. CCS has been around for, for several decades, of course, but it hasn't scaled up. So we're still at that relatively embryonic um, fast forming uh, stage of, of the technology. And it, it's, a, it's still a high cost uh, application. So if companies want to use carbon capture or any of these technologies as a carbon abatement method, they're looking, of course, for the commercial rationale to do that beyond uh, the desire to, to be a better uh, corporate citizen. And in some parts of the world, there are carbon pricing regimes uh, to some degree, but generally speaking, those carbon pricing regimes or, or equivalent, those incentives are not high enough yet um, to, to bridge the gap between the cost of applying these technologies and the commercial compensation to do so. What that means is that there has to be a lot of effort on the commercial part of this value chain. And this is where we talk about um, creating value. And so the challenge, and I'm gonna flip this on its head and say it's an opportunity, is to, is to create, as I work as an industry, to create a value and a value chain from CO2. What I'd like to do is just Kind of talk you through some of those steps. Um, my video keeps disappearing. I apologize. There we are. Um, so what we're doing here is we're walking through the value chain of carbon capture and storage. It starts, of course, with the capture of the CO2. And we've hinted at the fact so far that CO2 comes from a number of different sources, oil and gas production, processing, liquefaction, the use of uh, fossil fuels to create power, so gas-fired and coal-fired power, the use of fossil fuels as a, as a power and heat source in industrial settings. And because of the big range of cost and technical feasibility, what this is doing is it's creating um, a problem that technology and the energy industry and all the ingenuity of our industry is, is rising to try and solve. And we're seeing an emerging service and technology industry come to help solve this problem, which is, which is creating value for those companies. Then we have uh, the, the need to, once the CO2 is captured, to transport it somewhere safely. And uh, what this is doing is it's creating uh, a specialist midstream sector, much as we've seen in the transportation of natural gas through pipes or uh, indeed uh, through vessels in the LNG industry. Um, and this requires uh, quite a bit of, of course, engineering know-how, but also the commercial structures for, you know, how and where we transport that CO2. Finally, what we need is a destination for that CO2. And there are a variety of different options here with um, varying permanence because of course we want that CO2 to be permanently ideally permanently locked away from the atmosphere never to be emitted again so we can look at injecting it subsurface uh, into depleted oil and gas fields into aquifers 
into minerals uh, even. Um, we can inject it subsurface to enhance recovery of oil and gas. Uh, and that's a, a very active strand of this value chain today because it provides a clear, at the end, uh, commercial rationale. I think what we're seeing is a trend to away from that to a certain extent because of the, the doubt over um, overall life cycle emissions of you know, producing more oil and gas to then be combusted to then produce more emissions. There's a little bit of doubt about the overall life cycle uh, net gain or, or loss of, of CO2 there. And then what we're seeing is an emergence of markets, even though it's very small today, to, to produce and then to sell uh, that captured CO2 into various different other settings, um, whether that's food uh, manufacturing, chemicals, uh, and so on. So I, I think that we're at the very start of, of, of this becoming a, a broader value chain. Companies, governments have a, have a, big, a big role to play here. I hope I've um, kind of spelled out some of the different options for where companies can participate with technology application, um, expertise, and a new business. And I want to just kind of pick up on that point around corporate involvement here. And um, I'm going to try and use the oil and gas majors as a bit of a vehicle to tell this story. And there's absolutely no doubt that companies' allocation to decarbonization generally and the production of new low carbon uh, revenue streams is, is rising sharply. And I'm sure that you've all seen uh, over the past few years these memes uh, on social media around how it started and how it's going. So this is our attempt at a, a bit of the same. So this chart here that I'm showing is, is and you'll notice a, a few familiar names on there, I'm sure. And what we're showing is uh, in 2019 into 2020, these companies stated allocation budgets on uh, of from their whole capital into um, Oh, sorry, my video has gone off again. Into, uh, into new energies and, and low carbon energies. And um, I'm going to just switch on and see how it's going. So how it started versus how it's going. And you can see, first of all, a lot more logos on there you can see a real transformation in terms of where those logos sit. Many more, um, many more dollars allocated to, to low carbon energies. We see not just the Euro majors on there anymore, but uh, the US majors too, and a few NOCs. And you know, let's just acknowledge that some of these companies are now allocating a third of their budgets uh, a plus towards new energy allocation. And, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about the big oil companies here, but I also want to say that, you know, there are many, many other companies as part of our industries who are following the same path. Um, but the, but the, the major oil and gas companies are the ones leading the way. Okay, so that was some big picture stuff. What I want to do now is just talk specifically about CCUS and low carbon hydrogen. I know we have um, a number of really great um, sessions talk, diving into different parts of this today. So this is going to stay fairly kind of big picture and, and high level. Um, but I want to start by saying um, that, that, you know, this time last year, Wood McKenzie was, was looking at this space broadly um, but we didn't have dedicated teams of research analysts, we, and, and now we do. Um, and that's a recognition of the fact that uh, in both carbon capture and storage and in low carbon hydrogen, the pipelines, the project pipelines, the number of announcements, the amount of momentum in these industries in the last 12 months has absolutely ballooned. And I think there are a number of different reasons for that. Some of them we've talked about already, the increase in pledges and net zero targets, the sniff of an opportunity um, of, a new, of new revenues and new business models coming into this. Um, 
and you know supportive policies are a very big part to, had, had a bit, very big part to play here too so the charts i'm showing you here just show the step up in in how how we've tracked it so we're tracking projects we're tracking announcements you know line by line and um these charts show us a snapshot of of what the pipelines represented it over the past couple of years and um you know we're expecting again another step up in 2022 but still we need more remember the very very first slide that i showed with that massive transformation and the big role that carbon capture and low carbon hydrogen have to play in that in, in that bumpy path um, we need much more ccs than this and we need, need much more low carbon hydrogen than this so we think there are very big growth industries to come CCS is happening all over the world. Um, you know, this time, even this time last year, we were looking at CCS being largely a North America driven story, largely UR driven as well from through the commercials. And over the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen, you know, a burst of new announcements in Northern Europe much more activity and pledges in Middle East, parts of Asia Pacific, Australia uh, really stands out too, as well as, of course, you know, a, a huge amount of, of, of increased momentum in the US and Canada. So this is a real um, diversity story in my mind. And, you know, who doesn't love diversity? But, you know, diversity as part of an industry, especially an emerging industry, I think is a hugely positive sign that we're seeing true momentum around this. And it's not just geographical diversity we're looking at here. We're talking about diversity of the industries that are looking to apply uh, CCS as a carbon abatement method. And let me just step you through this chart quite briefly. So we're looking here at announced projects, planned capacity um, for, for carbon capture. And on the very left-hand side, we have the capacity in CCS is operational today. Um, it's just north of 40 million tonnes per annum. That's less than half a percent of the global uh, CO2 emissions globally. And most of that capacity is centred in, in the USA, actually. It's very focused on decarbonising high CO2 natural gas. But what we're going to see as we step through this decade, we believe, is uh, the use of CCS at different industries and those classic so-called hard to abate industries. So industries where some sort of fossil fuel or hydrocarbon is absolutely integral to, to that industry is very hard to electrify uh, or we need a, some a hydrocarbon as a feedstock, for, for example. So we're going to see CCS applied in power, uh, to, to talk about hydrogen production, we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, we're going to see it in steel, in petrochemicals, in cement production. And I think, again, this is a, a potentially a, a sign of really good progress for, for the CCS industry. I mentioned hydrogen just there, and I, I want to just kind of spend a moment to talk about hydrogen because it has its very own value chain that is quite complex actually and, and a bit different and even though you know often we think about carbon capture and storage and hydrogen as as two parts of an industry that are quite joined at the hip you know very much interlinked there are different drivers for the industry so you know when we talk about the production of hydrogen um, there's a lot of hydrogen produced today in the world and a, and a lot of demand and it's needed um, as a feedstock for uh, for example, for ammonia going into fertilizer, uh, it's, it's required as part of the refining process. But we'll see many more end use sectors and growing demand, growing strands of demand for hydrogen as, as we move through that bumpy path, we think. So the question is, where does that hydrogen come from? How do we produce it? And right now, we produce hydrogen using hydrocarbons, which uh, of course doesn't need to be uh, the case. Um, so what we're gonna see going forward is much less um, hydrogen as we know it today and 
move a move towards what we what we call low carbon hydrogen. So that's either um, hydrogen produced from natural gas that's then abated with with CCS blue hydrogen, or green hydrogen which is uh, electrolyzed using using water source. And you know, I, I, again, I just wanted to kind of pause on hydrogen a little bit to to acknowledge its its huge role potentially in in this energy transition, and you know, very congruent uh, to oil and gas um, skills investment infrastructure also. So I want to finish um, today the the prepared presentation by by putting a couple of. Uh, visions out there. So this uh, this slide that I'm showing is uh, a, a picture of an integrated energy hub. It's from some work that we've done at Woodmac with uh, the UK and Scottish governments to think about, to help them think about investing in a different kind of energy system in the future. It's had some input from the Norwegian um, sector too. And this is an example of a North Sea net zero cluster. And let me just put, point out a few things here. So we have in the offshore, we have offshore wind turbines and onshore wind turbines powering electrolysis to produce uh, green hydrogen, for example. We have them um, also powering offshore oil and gas facilities. And um, this is an integrated symbiotic relationship where different parts of an energy value chain sit together. We also have power stations, uh, fossil fueled fire power stations abated using CCS, that CO2 being shipped and injected offshore, um, and a number of different codependent parts of industry and the energy system living together. It feels visionary, it feels a little bit um, far-fetched to some people, but this is happening in different parts of the world. And I think that we will see many more of these types of clusters and hubs emerging, particularly in advantaged coastal um, locations uh, where, where there is a need for energy and a need for industry around the world. And I'm just gonna finish by bringing it home a little bit, not home to me, but home to, I think, where most of the audience is today. Um, by looking at applying the same sort of vision to uh, the US Gulf Coast, because I think it's well recognized and now acknowledged that uh, the US Gulf Coast, which is a large area, is um, an emerging hotspot for collaborative carbon abatement methods and could be you know, one of these locations where we see one of those visionary net zero clusters in, in the near future. And the map I'm showing here just in that panel is, um, is actually a, a snapshot of one of our tools here at Woodmac called the Emissions Benchmarking Tool, where we're taking individual assets and looking at their emissions. So each of those bubbles represents a, a refining facility and the bubble size relates to the emissions, the CO2 emissions that that facility has. And I, I've, I'm just just showing the, the refining facilities there, but imagine if you can just layering on top of that, um, the many different liquefaction facilities that are in this area, new build hydrogen and ammonia production facilities on here. And you can soon start to imagine that there are clusters of hydrocarbon fueled uh, industries that, that there is a strong need for uh, going forward and therefore a strong need to decarbonize and potentially abate using things like low carbon hydrogen or, or CCUS. And they're also co-located with um, large volumes of potential CO2 storage capacity in, uh, of course, um, the Gulf of Mexico. And on top of that, we have the large industry expertise and the infrastructure and the skills and the motivation um, from, from a very strong and inherent um, global oil and gas sector. So I, I think our view here is that there are many, if not all of the right ingredients um, to make something like this happen, but there does need to be a few key steps before we can see this happening. And I'm gonna start with those um, three slides, uh, three panels at, on the right-hand side from the very bottom. So this requires tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars of investment 
Um, when ExxonMobil talks about its Houston Ship Channel concept, it hints at that level of investment here. And um, what that requires, of course, is you know, the, the, the appetite to invest uh, in this sort of uh, future. There is also quite a lot of work we would say to do in the policy and regulation space. We need to see um, what can be salvaged from Build Back Better Bill, for example, to complement uh, the huge funding packages put forward from the Infrastructure Act. Um, we need to think about CO2 storage offshore and enabling that uh, and the proper licensing to be able to for, for that to be regulated. And lastly, uh, and this is the kind of secret sauce, if you like, is what we call co-opetition. And this word is a, an amalgamation of the words um, competition and collaboration. And it's this concept that uh, the companies involved in, in such a venture and such a vision may actually normally be competitors. They're competing for the same investment dollars. They're competing for acreage. They're competing for employees. Um, they're in a space and an industry where they would normal, normally um, be, be jostling with each other. And it also involves um, companies who may never normally interact. You know, how often would a cement producer, for example, interact with a refiner or an upstream oil and gas operator? So there's, uh, I think uh, Dwayne mentioned it earlier, or, or perhaps in his, uh, his opening uh, speech, that this is a paradigm shift. And I think that's a fair comment, but um, there's a real opportunity here with co-opetition uh, to make this happen. So my last slide is just a sum up um, before we take some, some Q&A. Um, and I'll take you back to that very first slide with the rainbow and the swathe and, and the different path between a two and a half to 2.7 degree scenario and the one and a half one. And emphasizing or just reminding ourselves again about the need for speed, the need for action um, very urgently and the need to use all the tools in our toolbox here. You know, we talked about this being a multiple uh, decarbonization solution scenario. We also talked, I think, through various different parts of, of there, the huge opportunity that this potentially brings, a big investment opportunity, um, and the opportunity to use and to transfer skills, infrastructure, know-how, and investment dollars or investment budgets uh, from the existing and, and very strong oil and gas industry. And then finally, just to kind of finish once more on this concept of co-opetition, because ultimately what we're looking at here is uh, a multi-industry, multi-country, multi-society problem, which, um, which requires a multi-industry solution. And uh, I'll end the prepared presentation there. I'll stop sharing my screen. Hope my video stays on and um, looking forward to taking some questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Barry. Um, as you mentioned, we're ready to take some questions. We do have one uh, that Joe Schindler has submitted. So I'll go ahead and ask that now. Um, in the meantime, please, yes, you can type them in the chat, or if you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself, show your video, and you can ask very directly. We'd love that too. So Joe asked, um, isn't it a double dip to get paid for carbon capture and then sell that CO2 later on? You would no longer have it captured. Yes, yeah. So um, I think that's a, a, a great point and certainly one that seems uh, counterintuitive to many members of the public too. You know, we're, we're paying big oil to capture and then store and get rid of their own CO2. Um, it seems like it isn't something that, that always sits um, completely squarely with, uh, with the public and, you know, many other organizations as well. I think what we're seeing uh, is a trend, certainly in the US and in other parts of the world, where credits or incentives are only applicable if there's a proven permanence to the sequestration of that CO2. Um, and that can be, you know, mostly that is driving towards reservoir storage 
uh, for non-EOR applications. Um, of course, if you're selling that CO2 then as a revenue stream, then it, yeah, then it is essentially a, a double dip. Okay, great. Um, and then I personally really loved your slide of how it started versus how it's going. So in that slide, you showed some really good progress, but within those or, or outside of those, um, who are you seeing as the key players or the companies to watch? In yeah. Your okay, great. Yeah, great question. So um, I probably won't go over any of that in the, in the slide because it's clear that, you know, you know, the oil and gas majors are, are leading the way. So outside of that, if I can think about, um, you know, let's just think about sort of CCS and, and low carbon hydrogen for now. There are a number of really interesting companies in the capture technology space. Um, so thinking about ways to lower the cost uh, of carbon capture, um, to name a few, uh, Svante, looking at different technologies, um, uh, Climeworks, carbon engineering in the direct air capture space. There's a, a really interesting company based out of Norway called Acker Carbon Capture that's looking at modularizing that. So I would say keep, keep an eye on that on that tech space. Um, in terms of companies who are really motivated to decarbonize that aren't oil and gas players, I, I've actually been amazed by the the motivation and the action of the cement industry um so the big kind of top three cement players are all looking at uh you know low carbon hydrogen use and and and, and ccs as abatement options and you know the cement sector is one of those true kind of hard to abate sectors um and yeah i think i mentioned it earlier uh in the speech around this this idea of, of specialist midstream um, and, and the emergence of uh, hydrogen and CO2 midstream industry, I think there are, you know, that's a space to watch uh, for sure this decade as well. Awesome. I'm going to do a shameless plug for um, one of our sponsors, Protium. He, they are a midstream company specializing in hydrogen and CO2. So, um, isn't next, it, I promise. <laughs> yeah. um, so I know you mentioned direct air capture uh, a moment ago about some technology to really watch for. It does look to be really expensive. Do you expect for it to get any cheaper? Uh, so I think this, the short answer to that is yes. Um, you know, if we if we think about traditional CCS being a relatively early stage um, sector in terms of scale, then direct air capture is kind of even more uh, early stage, it's even more embryonic. I think that, you know, there are perhaps 15, 20 projects that are underway in, in some shape or form in direct air capture globally. Um, but it is, I think, less than 1% of the project pipeline right now in terms of capacity. So we're still at that very early stage of small scale, kind of looking to scale up into megaton level removal. This decade's absolutely critical for that, I would say, Leslie. And, and there are a number of different, um, you know, as with traditional carbon capture, there are a number of different technology approaches being trialed. Um, and I, I have to say the, you know, the billions of dollars put towards direct air capture specifically in the infrastructure bill, US infrastructure bill last year is exactly the sort of funding package that's required to scale up something that could be actually, you know, really quite um, important in, in the transformation journey. Okay, we do have, thank you for that. We do have one more question from the audience. Um, how does Woodmac view the commitment of China to carbon management? Just window dressing or as a serious effort? Excellent question. Um, <clears throat> so if we think about um, China's five-year plans and the pledges and the commitments that are within those, um, they are, not as explicit as they need to be right now uh, in terms of action and funding packages to, to make projects happen. I would say over the last 12 months, those plans have become more transparent. They have become more explicit in terms of um, developing out hubs for CCS and, and sequestration. There's very little doubt about the fact that there's a huge amount of CO2 storage potential um, within China. 
And there's also very little doubt that as an end, as a, as a, as a country with huge uh, potential need for carbon capture because of a, a, a very fossil fuel heavy uh, power sector, power and industry sector, heavy industry sector, that there's a need. So there's the need, there's the potential in terms of storage, but the gap, the disconnect right now is in terms of action to make those projects happen. I think um, we need to see an acceleration if we're going to make, make uh, you know, that bumpy path happen. Answer. <clears throat> um, another question from the audience. Any idea on how to solve the flaring issue? It's hard because the oil and gas sector looks always to the cheapest technology to implement. And if it was something that requires additional capex, it's cheaper to flare it. Indeed, yeah. And, um, and you know, we see that in you know, pretty much every part of the world where, where there, there is some barrier to, to solving flaring, whether that's, you know, a lack of gas marketing or as you said, the, the, the cost to implement those, um, those issues. You know, I, I'm going to say like a typical analyst here when I say I don't think there's one simple solution, but um, incentivizing it from a regulatory perspective. So, you know, a bigger clamp down um, on on it from a regulatory perspective it is what's worked. I mentioned the stats here in the UK that that's what's worked. You know, the regulator has taken a very hard stand on that. I should also say that there is clearly um, the emissions trading scheme that's here uh, too, which acts as a bit of a, a, a stick in that regard. But I think it, it kind of needs to come from the top because there is no clear commercial rationale for doing that on its own. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, we have about two minutes left. Uh, does anybody else have any last minute questions? Otherwise, I'll ask, I'll ask one more question. Um, uh, let's see. I guess I'm going to ask you a kind of a lighthearted question, but how is the weather in Scotland right now? And have you noticed a change in the winters or the springs over your decades of living there relating to, of course, climate change? Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the weather today is what I would call a, a typical early spring day. Um, pretty bright and pretty cold. Have we noticed the change? Yes, is the is the kind of straight answer to that. We've had um, harsher, you know, less distinction between the seasons. We've had some really harsh uh, storms and weather systems coming through. It felt like we were just in a constant storm uh, for the past sort of six months or so. Um, and the other thing is that I live right by the beach. I, I live right by the coast um, in here. And we're starting to, uh, you know, we're starting to feel a bit worried about coastal communities in different parts of the world. And, you know, probably Northern Europe's the, not a super affected area. But when you live by the coast and you see this extreme weather coming in, it, it, it certainly does bring it home that, you know, there's an urgent need for, 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 claim, for, for, for climate impact um, measures. And the other thing that I'll just add that kind of adds to that urgency for, for me personally is um, I live right by the Firth of Forth. If anyone's ever been to Edinburgh, they, they might know where that is. And it's a, a safe harbour region for, for rigs and vessels that aren't working in the offshore oil and gas sector uh, right now. So they come in and they, and they rest there. And uh, if there's ever a kind of urgent reminder of um, what's happening in our oil and gas industry, it's, it's, going, it's sitting, seeing idle rigs sitting there uh, when you draw the curtains in the morning. So um, yeah, good, nice question about, uh, about that, yeah. Um, we are, our session's technically over. We do have one more question that just came through if you have the time. Of course. Okay, yeah. great. It is, any thoughts on monetizing gas at the wellhead with hydrogen or ammonia production in effort to reduce or incentive, to reduce incentive to flare or vent? I can ask that again if you'd like. So, yeah, it might, yeah, it might be good to ask it just to using gas at the wellhead. Any thoughts on monetizing gas at the wellhead using hydrogen or ammonia production in effort to reduce the incentive to flare or vent the gas? Well, wow, that's a thought. Um, I, I, so I have to say it's not something that I've come across before. 
I can see the motivations uh, in sort of in it's a different stream. It reduces the potential to flare. Uh, I'm not sure operationally how feasible that is. That's probably one for the uh, the more operational uh, folks in the room. Uh, I suppose the straight answer is I don't have too many thoughts on it. Uh, it's not something I've come across uh, to date. Great. Very. Thank you again so much for your time today. Pleasure. And um, I think our next session starts at 940. So um, in the meantime, everyone can just go hang out in the platform, connect, check out the game. Um, again, plan your sessions for the morning and we will see you at the upcoming events. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie.